this edition of Leak Project. I am your host, Rex Bear, and we have Marshall Masters with us from YOWUSA.com. Is Planet X nearing Perhelion? Now, I might have said that name a little bit off, but Marshall will correct me. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight here at the Leak Project. Marshall, how the heck are you? All right. Oh, it's great to be back, Rex. Right on. I appreciate you reaching out to me, and also I've been looking through this article and you've done it quite well. I mean, there's a lot of information on here, and I was hoping we could just jump right in. You see some possible dire straits type events happening here pretty soon. Well, you know, this is something where we've been wondering when will Planet X or the Planet X system reach perihelion, specifically when will the sun's smaller twin, Nemesis, a brown dwarf star, when will it reach its point of perihelion in its 3600 year orbit which is that point closest to the sun and here is something that comes with blue kachina red kachina prophecy because i this really began with the most bizarre things uh somebody asked me to listen to uh, a youtube video by archangel michael and as a rule i just tend to sidestep machine language videos. You know, the ones that you can always tell it's a machine. <laughs> and right. it just has that consistent, you know, um, that elevator quality to it. And there was something in there that caught her attention. And then she said, well, is the pole shift going to happen on March 20th of this year is what this guy's saying. Well, it's March 21st, so that obviously was an error. Uh, but what was interesting was that I listened to it, and they were talking about March 20th being perihelion. Then they said March 20th was the equinox. Well, it's the equinox, not the perihelion. That is for our planet. However, it did bring a question in my mind. Well, what about perihelion for planet X. And I was thinking about that. And then there was a video that showed up and you know, I have several folks that send me links to all the newest stuff. And one of the things we begun seeing is uh, a blue halo, a larger object that is to the three o'clock of the sun relative to the horizon, which is not actually where it is in space. If you were to you know, be off Earth and you were looking at the sun uh, relative to the sun's equator, which, you know, if you just expand that out to the 12 signs of the zodiac, that's the galactic, that's the uh, ecliptic, the plane of our system. And when you do that, then this object is actually about the 130 position. But we have been tracking this extensively. I have reported it in my video, Planet X Update number four, the second of that three-part series, which was Reliable Observations, where we had the same object appearing in Brazil, Spain, and elsewhere around the world. And so it was pretty consistent. We were getting good images on it. And they were holding up to gamma analysis and Gamma analysis that I do is think of your home stereo system and you have all the different controls. You can have an equalizer for setting, you know, low bands, high bands, mid bands. You can set treble, you can set bass, you can boost, you can do all this stuff. But then you got that big volume knob. And when you crank that down, what you notice is you crank it down as, you know, different parts of the music start to go away. And what's left at the end is going to be, you know, like a bass drum, bass guitar, thump, 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 that kind of stuff. That's what's left. Well, when you're looking at digital image, mind, this is only something that could be done with digital cameras, not with film cameras. But gamma is like that big volume knob. It turns everything up or it turns everything down. But however, when you turn it down, there are a lot of things going to go away, but then there's things that are going to, you know, thump, the thump, the thump. They're going to stay. So I divide these into two classes, cold objects and hot objects. Now, a hot object is something that is generating light toward the camera 
or it could be something that has a very strong reflection of light so, towards the camera. But there is a strong source of light coming from that object. And this is common to natural objects. Now, you have cold objects, for example, uh, clouds are kind of lukewarm, coldish. So they'll disappear, but they can hang in there for a little bit on gamma analysis until you really crank it down. The one thing that's going to disappear very quickly in gamma are going to be lens flare, flares and aberration. Uh, this is not an absolute, uh, particularly with smartphones when you're taking digital still images, and they can create false, pro false positives. But it's a very good general rule of thumb. And so when I'm doing smartphone observations, and that's really what you get these days, I'm looking for video. I'm not looking for stills. Stills, I just don't pay a serious attention to them. But if it's a video, then you're able to see if they're, especially if it's handheld and they're moving around, if the object of interest remains fixed and relative to the sun, or if it dances all around like a lens flare. So these are the kind of tests that I do, and there's some others, but these are the principal ones that I do. And then if it stands up to that, the next thing I'll do is pull up Starry Night, or even, you know, you can, for those at, at home, you don't want to get into a sky program, uh, there's Solar System Scope. You go to their website for free and put in a date and a time, and you can see what the alignment of the planets in our solar system and with this three o'clock position, given the size, and if you look at the top of the article where it's actually the image is planted X nearing perihelion, this was a screen of the gamma test. And the object of interest is to the right of the sun, again, at the three o'clock relative to the horizon. And what really stood out for me was when I looked at the original imagery, it had a bluish little halo to it, a corona. And that really, during the gamma testing, came out even more intense. And the reason why, Rex, this really got my attention is that it brings us to the Hopi prophecy uh, of the Blue Kachina and Red Kachina. And for those that may not have heard of that before, there's an ancient Hopi prophecy. It's been written about extensively. And there's two Kachinas or stars that are going to be apparent. The first one will be a blue star. And then it is the harbinger of the worst uh, of the two, which is the red star, which will then appear afterwards. Well, most people tend to think of this prophecy as talking about two different stars. And if people do not understand, you know, Doppler waves, then they're not going to understand that you're really talking about the same image, and it's called red Doppler shift and blue Doppler shift. And what it really means is when an object is closing on you in space, the light waves are, are going to be compressed, and so it's going to be bluish. When you're spreading apart, the light waves are going to elongate, and so it looks reddish, hence red shift, or blue shift. So what that really means is if it's blue shift, you know that, that you're. And that is, you know, I've been talking with several of the folks that uh, communicate with me and in these reports where there's this little bit of blue halo. Well, that would tend to indicate that the nemesis star with us and that it could very well be it is in that phase of its orbit. And this is all in the article. I break it all, all down. Uh, but there's a heading called Acceleration at Perihelion. Now, Rex, at this point, I, I do want to throw something in because I debunk the debunking strategy of what's called center of mass, describing the relationship of Nemesis and our sun. And in binary star systems, you got two stars that are large. One is going to be larger than the other, typically. But they're going to find a common center of mass, and they're going to orbit around that center of mass. And so when we're talking about planet X or Nemesis being in a comet-like 3,600-year orbit, they go, well, that's 
because you have two suns and they would have a center of mass. The key words, all right, and what I point out is that this is a small dwarf, and it's you know, uh, it's not even one percent the mass of our sun. Like saying a hummingbird can nudge a water buffalo. All right, um, that's just not going to happen. That's the reason why Nemesis is in a comet-like orbit. All right, and. And it's a specious argument. It really kind of sucks people in because they talk about diameter. They talk about size. The orbital mechanics here, size has nothing to do with it. Mass, that's got everything to do with it. You know, you can hold a dirt clod in one hand and then you can hold a meteorite in the other. And trust me, you can be really straining to hold the meteorite if they're, you know, both of good size. And uh, so now when we're talking about, you know, we have blue shift and red shift. And what's interesting to me is the point of perihelion, because Kepler's second law, this is about the point in time where Nemesis uh, and the planet X system, all the bodies, start an acceleration phase. And in the image I have on the site, you'll see I actually have a little amusement park of the whip, the ride that you have, where you've got these two levels at each end, and the kids sit there and they ride on the long, you know, straight side of this ride, which is tedious. But then you get to the turnbuckle and you whip right around, which is why they call it the whip. Well, what works in an amusement park is exactly the way it works in the orbit of the nemesis brown dwarf around its larger uh, cousin. And so... If that's the case, then in it's in this acceleration phase, then it's closing with us. And that would explain the blue shift that we're beginning to see in observation reports. And once it reaches the point of perihelion, and the point of perihelion is where it is closest to the orbit of the sun. And one of the things I do show in the uh, illustration is we go around the sun counterclockwise, but this goes in a clockwise orbit. And this has been reported by astronomers. It's also been reported by Zachariah Sitchin decoding the Sumerian texts. And that's uh, these are important things. So this video about Archangel Michael and the Golden Age, uh, this is something where it they made uh, they made an error when they were mixing perihelion equinox. But the interesting thing is, you know, it doesn't matter how big the sour bar of soap is, if you flip on it, you fall in the shower. So let's get to the meat of the matter perihelion. What does this mean to everyone on planet Earth? Well, there's an area in the orbit which we call the kill zone for this planet X system. Now, for the better part of its orbit, or most of its orbit, it's in the southern skies and it doesn't present a problem even when it comes up behind the ecliptic, but it's arcing in towards its point of perihelion, it's not really causing a problem. However, once it does reach point of perihelion, then from perihelion to the ecliptic, the plane of the solar system, which again, is, remember, it's like, let's think about the sun's equator and stretching it out to the 12 signs of the zodiac. When it goes from perihelion to the ecliptic, this is the kill zone. This is when bad things are really going to start happening, and they're going to happen quickly. Because once it reaches perihelion, it is still going to be accelerating uh, through, you know, because remember, perihelion, half of the acceleration phase is before perihelion, and, and the other half of it is after. So it's when it reaches perihelion, it's still gaining speed. And what we'll see is that it will pass over our heads as it moves to its position on the ecliptic, which will be between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Now, let's go back to blue kachina, red kachina. From perihelion to the point where it's overhead, we're going to have the blue kachina because it's closing on us. But once it goes past our orbit, 
over our heads, then it is gaining distance from us and it's going to go to redshift. So blue will then become red, blue kachina becomes the red kachina. And when it reaches the ecliptic, if we are on the same side of the sun as the planet X system, when it reaches ecliptic on its southbound leg, or in other words, it's as it's headed towards its point of aphelion, its furthest distance from the sun. And so as it reaches that point where it is between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, that's when the what I call Nibiru pole shift is going to occur. Now, uh, there's multiple objects, and it's like our solar system. You know, we have major planets, we have minor planets, we have dwarf planets. All right, that system is the same. It has a total of seven objects, varying in size. We just focus on Nemesis, which is the brown dwarf at the center of it, and the three major planets, which are Helion, Arboda, and Nibiru. Now, what will happen is Nibiru, which is translated in Sumerian as the... Uh, the planet of crossing is going to cross between the earth and the orbit of Venus. And it's going to pass in front of us, which brings us to the prophecy of the days of darkness and the days of darkness. And I describe all of this in very good detail in my book, surviving the planet X tribulation with illustrations. And it's going to pass between us and the sun. But instead of like a full lunar, you know, event where we would see the umbral outline and that halo that's around the edge, uh, this is just all going it, to, it's going to go pitch black. It's going to completely blot out the sun that's reaching us. And we are going to know darkness on Earth such as we have never imagined. And that will be a horrific time. Now, Around this time is when Major Ed Dames is saying that the kill shot is going to happen somewhere during this perihelion to ecliptic phase. Uh, what Ed Dames is saying is that they have observed this in their remote viewing. And he first reported this in a video he produced in 2004 when he was living in Hawaii. And uh, he introduced the kill shot then. And actually, back in 2004... He was much further along on this topic than I was. I was just really, I, I didn't start, and my first article was in 2002, so I was just really coming up to speed back then. But he had a real good beat on this, and so what he's talking about is we're going to have solar sprites, or what you could think of as cosmic lightning. Now, what does this mean? All right, well, if it's not Earth-directed, then it looks, Looks like there, for the grace of God, we didn't get caught in the bug zapper. But if it is Earth-directed, all right, and it hits us, that's going to leave a mark. And, you know, I've been in the Grand Canyon, flown through it. I have a hard time buying the argument that the Grand Canyon is a, uh, was created by water erosion. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's still kind of a stretch for me. But be as it may, let's talk about the largest canyon in our solar system, which is not the Grand Canyon. It's Valmer Neris on Mars. Now, are scientists going to tell us that there was enough water on Mars to create the erosion that caused Valmer Neris? No, I don't think they can. The one thing that does explain it is a Mars-directed solar sprite or the planet and just tore into it. And a lot of damage. So if we have one of those events, is it an extinction-level event for all of humanity? No, it will be a regional cataclysm of profound importance. It is going to cause a lot of problems on a regional basis, kill a lot of people. It will throw a lot of debris up into the air. So there will be global effects, but it will not be a, uh, an ELE, an extinction level event for our species. And that is what he is seeing. So when he was asked about, is there going to be a pole shift uh, in his last presentation, uh, August of last year. He's since retired. That was it. He finally came clean, talked about it, said Planet X is real. It's going to come. And he said back then that we will see it November of this year. 
and that it will look as big as the moon in the, the sky. So, you know, that, that tells me that we're going to, when we do see it, it's going to be extremely large. It'll probably be at that point where it's somewhere from perihelion to directly over the orbit of Earth, and it'll be large. People are going to be looking at it. It'll be scary. Uh, the talking heads will come on the media and say, well, obviously it's passing over our heads, so don't worry about it. Just an interesting light show. But it's not an interesting light show. And unfortunately, most people are going to buy into the light show theory. And they'll die during the pole shift because 70% of the planet is uh, large basins of water, seas, and great lakes. And the vast majority of humanity lives along those shorelines. And all of those shorelines are going to be decimated uh, during the pole shift because the water is going to come out of its basins. And when that happens, uh, you know, if you're in the wrong place, that's it. I don't care how much survival food you have in your garage, you and your survival food are going to wind up joining the fossil record. So this is uh, something where I'm asking people in this video to go and take a look at it. One of the things I do later on down in the video um, or in the art article under the heading hot objects versus cold objects is I do a comparison. There was a video that was put out by a fellow called Baltimore, comma, Maryland. And this was originally posted in May 15, 2016. That channel and that original video have disappeared. And now there are knockoffs. There's a Baltimore MD, but it doesn't have Baltimore, comma. The comma is missing. So that makes it a completely different channel ID. And that was uploaded as of January of this year. So I am seeing on that video, um, and by the way, for those of you who subscribe to my Yowza channel, YOWUSA on YouTube, I took that original video that I downloaded back in May of 2016 and I reposted it so that you know you've got the real McCoy because I have seen other variants and what they're doing is posting everything, but they trim off the last minute or two minutes of the video, which is, that's where you see it. Everything else is up leading up to that is, you know, taking off, going to altitude and so forth. So there's a lot of intentional disinformation and suppression on this video. They couldn't completely kill it. So they uh, eradicated the original post and channel and they have gone and put up a bunch of hoax spoofers and, uh, you know, in some cases, they have the original video. Others, you can see where they're trim editing, uh, look-alike names, all this kind of stuff. You know, this is, this is not high school kids having fun. These are paid disinformationalists who are trying to suppress what was a very good observation because I find that the best observations are at altitude um, or in areas where you know you're going to be above the chemtrail layer. That's really important. Chemtrail, uh, we're supposed to call it geosynchronous or geoengineering now, or there's even a new, they keep changing the name so no one can get a beat on it. Stratosphere aerosol injections. For your pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. Add a little lithium in there and you'll feel wonderful. Oh, you know what? It's so funny. I got to just throw this out here real quick because they literally, um, there's a patent that somebody sent me, a very astute listener, and the patent, you can go to Google, you can read about it, and the mixture, the combination, it's called a binder, and it's for seeding the clouds. It's to cause ice capsules, essentially, and create uh, uh, different weather patterns and create rain, mm -hmm. and this stuff is so toxic. It has a chemical in it called hydrochloroxide or something like that, hydrobenthyl chloroxide, which is actually against the, the, the international treaty, the Stockholm uh, correspondence or whatever. I, the name's, that last part's missing me here. But the, I'm having the Stockholm syndrome while I'm talking about it. Nah, 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 nah. But, no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy. So this toxic pesticide, and the patent's from 1978, Marshall. So people that say chemtrails aren't real, you can see the patents from 1978. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it mayonnaise in outer space. It's a chemical trail, and the chemtrail is a perfect word for it. So I'm sorry, I'm digressing. 
Uh, no, I, I loved it, man. That was really good. You you nailed it. And uh, one of the things that happens with chemtrailing is, um, of course, you have the global dimming. But, you know, astronomers are finally saying, you know, this is making it hard for us to do our work. You know, we don't have – we don't look out and see clear skies. Uh, I can't remember what clear skies look like. I'm old enough to remember what clear skies look like. Uh, but – uh, you know, for f younger folks that, you know, have been around since all of this happened, uh, they really don't know what a clear sky looks like. Really don't. And that's that's sad. And this what they're spraying. This is just and the cover up and the suppression that goes with it. It's awful. But, you know, in terms of seeing Planet X, um, you know, when you're looking for Planet X, you can only look two times of the day. It's around sunrise, around sunset. Yeah, you know, I get it. Yeah, you know, I just shake my head and just, oh man, where do these guys come from when they go? Well, I went out my backyard today and I looked for it, and by golly, it wasn't there. And you can look at his image, and it's high noon. It's like you know, here's your stupid side. <laughs> I know. I, I look at this. Look at this aluminum and magnesium, and then that's the best stuff. The binder that they put in it is hexa chlorbenzene. And then when you look this up, as I said just a minute ago, the hexachlorbenzene is actually outlawed. It has an international outlaw. It's a carcinogen. Now, I'm not saying they're spraying this stuff, okay? I'm just saying here's a patent from 1978 that clearly shows. And then even in that 1978 article, they were talking about how cl uh, cloud seeding has been going on for ages, essentially. Um, so here it is right here. It is a... Um, the safety of it. Well, it's a probable human carcinogen. It's been considered absolutely an animal carcinogen. And it is uh, also, okay, so where has it been? Right here. Yeah, the Stockholm Convention. It is outlawed. It's been banned globally under the Stockholm Convention. But that didn't come out until 2004. So, you know, I can't say that they're still doing this. However, you clearly look up in the skies and you do see the geoengineering going on on a daily basis. And there's plenty of organizations out there that actually profit off of seeding the clouds. Like, for example, if you type in weather modification, that's chemtrails. That's what a chemtrail mm -hmm. is. Well, here you go. Weather modification. Where people see clouds, we see profit. Hello. All right. Yeah. I, yeah so let's, yeah, I'm sorry to digress. Let's go back. But that's, it exists for anybody out there that still says chemtrails aren't real. Ladies and gentlemen, chemtrails are real. That's right. They are real. You know, but people are, gosh, it's, it's hard to get them to, to look up and think about it, you know, I remember one time I was walking through a parking lot where I lived and I looked up and there was a chemtrail jet and it was flying low and slow. This thing was like around 10,000 feet and you can watch it and it's like, I call it chemtrail dingo balls, you know, <laughs> like you can see in the <laughs> low rider and where it comes out in clumps, clump, 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 and it looks like these little balls, dingo balls, you know, that hang on. And then you watch the dingo balls, they hang, they cling, and then they disperse. And you just, then you watch them disperse out and become big smudgy clouds. And this stuff was right overhead. And I mean, I mean, whoa, low and slow. I never saw it that close up and personal. And there was this woman walking through the parking lot and so I just said, hey, uh, look up. Look what their spray got us. And she just looked straight in my eyes, refused to look up, looked at me like I was totally insane, spun around on her heels, grabbed her doggy in close on the leash, and she just hooked him in the opposite direction. You know, feet don't fail me now. So, yeah, there's still people that – they refuse to look up. They don't want to know the bad news. <laughs> Must not look up. Might see clouds over me. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> it is unbelievable. Well, hey, there you go, though. It makes it, it makes it easier for these very intelligent people that have way too much money, way too much power, way too much control to decide the fate of so many people that just aren't willing to look up. And I think that's important. And that's one of the things I like about what you do, what you've talked about for so many years. And I really feel you're a pioneer in waking people up and preparing. And whether or not people want to believe in Planet X, and here's one thing I want to make very clear, ladies and gentlemen, Planet X, well, there was just an article that came out where a uh, – 
a scientist that's getting his doctorate right now at, at John Hopkins University is actually um, claiming that, well, if you want to classify a planet, well, and if you're going to stick with specific parameters, the parameters that you were showing me would basically say that there's 100 planets in our solar system because you could take the planets of Jupiter, the planets of, of Saturn, and add it all up. You've got about 110 bodies in this solar system. So I think that the Planet X hypothesis and the fact that they're coming out with so many new disclosures about the uh, the Kuiper Belt, what's outside of it, and it's called the Trappist. It's seven different planets, and they're saying three of those are Earth-like. That's not too far out there. I do certainly see there being that possibility that Planet X could cause some serious damage wherever it is, because even Planet 9, if you want to call Planet 9 Planet X because they downgraded Pluto, well, let's look at that for a minute. Planet 9 has caused the Sun to tilt, and it's outside of the Kuiper Belt. Yeah, I mean, well, and Planet 9 was something they had to rush that to market, so to speak. What happened was uh, a couple of astronomers at uh, Arecibo, not at Arecibo, excuse me, another uh, major telescope down in Chile, and they were actually able to observe a super-Earth, something that was several times the size of Earth, and another object that they said they believed was a cold brown dwarf star. Now, the minute I read that and I went cold brown door star, anything, anything that su suggests or hints that we have a multiple sun system is immediately suppressed, period. And so I knew the wrath of God was going to fall on these people. Well, I wouldn't say the wrath of God, the wrath of the elites. I think God would rather we know the truth. Um, and it was... They, they were smeared, and I, I reported on this on my site, and they got some gal at the Washington Post, doesn't know anything about astronomy. Uh, her big thing is who makes the best bagels in New York, okay? So I call uh, her Bagel Babe. And bagel so Betty. Bagel Babe, yeah, Bagel Babe. <laughs> nice. And, uh, well, that's it. I mean, that's, you know, she does a food column, and uh, so she doesn't know anything about this. And so what they did was they did a hatchet job on the reputations of these astronomers, totally, totally eviscerated. And of course, you know, Bezos owns this newspaper. So, yeah, he's obviously, you know, part of the black cabal. And the thing about it is that they had to, and it was uh, Brown, he was, uses the title of Pluto killer. Now, he was not the guy who actually did the astronomy that proved that. Pluto didn't have the mass to be Neptune's perturber or that it was large enough to be planet X or a major planet anymore. So, and what they determined once they were able to, you know, they found its moon uh, was that Pluto is about 60% the size of our own moon. So that's, you know, not that big. Certainly doesn't have all the mass necessary to, to be Neptune's perturber or planet X. And so they used him to lead the charge on this. And he came out with this Planet X9, uh, Planet 9 theory. And, you know, it, it was after they did this terrible, vicious smear job. I mean, it was just, it was ugly what they were saying about these people. And they then they went out and smeared Percival Lowell. They smeared uh, Tomba, who discovered Pluto. You know, so it was one of these Planet X smear jobs. And Bagel Babe, you know, was just, you know, eating it up. I'm getting to play with the big boys. Oh, got some more locks for the bagel, you know. And Bagel right. Babe went out and did, did a real character assassination on these people. And, um, it, and it was just a sad, sad thing to see. And so they came out with Planet Nine because the original story by these Chilean astronomers uh, really resonated. It caught out there, especially in the, because they published two white papers and they said, here's what we find. Guys, let's go take a look. Let's let's solve this mystery together. They were doing good science. Who to thunk it? And, you know, so what do they get? They get politically crucified and they were forced to withdraw their papers. Not because that there was any scientific vetting process that they had run the hurdle on, they had to remove their papers because they were probably going to lose their funding, lose their reputations, get kicked out of their affiliations. I mean, 
It's pretty, pretty ugly. You know, so Brown then comes out with this Planet Nine thing. And they, you know, they made sure to call it Planet Nine instead of Planet X because they didn't want to give any credit to Planet X. Although there was a bunch of media that just said, well, they're saying Planet Nine, it's Planet X. And scientifically, it is Planet X that they're talking about because the term Planet X was really coined by Percival Lowell back in the early 1900s. And it just simply means a planet that we know exists by virtue of that we have observed its interaction with other planets. It's orbiting, it's, it's causing perturbations in other planets. And so we know it's out there because we know not by seeing it, but by seeing objects near it that are being affected by it. So until we actually observe the perturber, which is very real, it is designated X for the unknown. It's not planet X for planet number 10 or, you know, laundry soap or extra large, you know, men's boxer shorts or whatever you want. It's just simply planet X, the un, you know, the planet we know is out there because we see what it's doing to other planets, but we haven't observed it yet. And there was something that Brian Marsden, who passed away, but uh, was the, he, at the, the Smithsonian Astrophysics Lab, uh, he was the go-to guy when he was alive that you went to him if you were naming an object. And he said something that was really brilliant. He said, the failure to observe an object proves only one thing. You have failed to observe the object. That's it. That's all it proves. So, you know, for years I've been hearing uh, folks at NASA going, well, we haven't seen it, so it doesn't exist. And, you know, Who's the more intelligent about it? Somebody goes, it can't exist because we haven't found it yet? Or somebody goes, just because you don't observe it doesn't mean it doesn't prove anything other than you can't observe it. So this is the kind of nonsense and everything that goes on. But let's get more to the point here of what's coming down the road. If, in fact, Nemesis truly is approaching perihelion. Because once that happens, then Katie barred the door, all right? Things are going to start picking up. And if this is the case, if, you know, there was uh, just an interesting slip that, you know, what we're seeing now is it's approaching perihelion. Once it reaches point of perihelion and after that, we are going to have a flood of YouTube videos that are going to dwarf anything we could imagine right now. And right now, it just boggles my mind how many YouTube videos are coming out every day about observations. You know, a lot, a lot of it's dances with clouds, and there's a lot of carpetbaggers out there who are repacking stuff everybody saw last year and then putting these salacious titles, Best Nibiru Ever! Wow! Disprove this! And all that. And all these salacious <laughs> titles. You know, I mean, it reminds you. It's all caps, you, you know, dude. And it says NASA caps, in the same title. Know? It's got to be real. You know, they got to, and they really, you know, the, the music they should, you know, that, they should be doing that from the 50s. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of the carpetbaggers. They're just trying to distract people, pick up a few shekels on the AdSense revenue, have fun with it, because there's a lot of interest. We wouldn't have the carpetbaggers if we didn't have a lot of interest. And that's something I find interesting. There was a long time. It was a long, cold, lonely place to be. I know. I was there. <laughs> um, you know, now it's uh, folks are diving in and they're looking at this stuff. And I call it tribulation toking, you know, because folks aren't ready to start doing planning and preparation you know, they don't understand that during the tribulation, the three major causes of death are going to be denial, procrastination, and location. They're not going to do anything about that. Uh, but they feel that they're getting, doing something constructive and positive and uh, forthright. You know, and they sit there and they spend hours every day looking at, Ooh, you know, and every time they flip from one video video to another. It's like, I can just see him, you know, I call it tribulation toking. It's another hit on the bong. <sniffs> oh, wow, man, look at that. That is so cool. That is really Nibiru, man. You know? <laughs> Go 
glad it's not going to happen to me. And uh, that's kind of a sad thing to see all that denial and procrastination, but that'll pass as well, because at some point it's going to get past the, oh, wow, Cheech and Chong phase to people looking up at the sky and, you know, woo, what am I seeing? What am I seeing? And then there's the dangerous question, you know, what am I, what am I, you know, what am I going to see it with my own two eyes, which is the please elites kill me question. You know, that's really what it is. It's please elites kill me. Help me like a lemming go to my death going off the end of a cliff. Because if you're saying, well, uh, what am I going to see it with my own two eyes? What you're really saying is, when am I going to see it with my own two eyes and then race into the living room, turn on the TV so CNN can tell me what to think about it? And that's when they're going to get lied to. And that's when they're going to hear, don't worry, just an interesting light show. Everything will be fine. And then they go, cool. That's what I wanted to hear. That's what I wanted to hear. And uh, and they will give it another thought. But there will be people who look at that and go, you know, when will I believe what I am seeing with my own? own two eyes is a clear and present danger. Now that is the intelligent question. That is the question you ask that saves lives. When will I believe what I am seeing with my own two eyes is a clear and present danger? And maybe one in 10 will have the smarts to ask that question. The rest of them, they'll run right in, wait for CNN, Fox, MSNBC, any of these, you know, corporate media owned outlets that are doing, you know, propaganda and fake news. And that's how, you know, a lot of people are going to, just going to be fooled into thinking, don't sing light show. I'm just trying to get the message out. <laughs> when you hear that, <laughs> it's time to do something, you know, because uh, it's your last window of opportunity. It'll be your last chance. And um, yeah, so... Again, you know, Ed Dames is saying this year, another man who, uh, very fine gentleman, Bob Dean, government whistleblower, had, had top security clearance. And uh, the interesting thing about these guys that are blowing the whistle on Planet X is that they're not former admirals and generals. They are some of those that are talking. And these are, are the... Uh, the high-ranking non-commissioned officers, the ones with a ton of chevrons on their sleeves. Because what happens is they get the top security clearance that's possible because they're the ones in the vault with all of the secrets and they have the keys to the kingdom. And so you have to go through and jump hoops to, to get access to a particular secret, but you're going to go to this NCO who's got the keys to the kingdom and he's the one who's going to pull the file jacket and hand it to you. Well, these guys were sitting in these vaults and didn't have a lot of activity. So you get bored. Yeah. I mean, there's only yeah, the Times crossword gives it up after a while. And uh, they started pulling open file cabinets and reading. And that's when all of a sudden these guys, they're, you know, oh, my God. And they're having these mind bending experiences reading all this stuff. Well, Bob Dean. Uh, high, you know, he had this access. Other fellows that I've talked to, same exact thing, and they all say the same things. And so Bob Dean, and he made this prediction to Cassidy in a 2008 interview on Project Camelot. And he said, 2017, take it to the bank. And, you know, given, you know, back in 2008, that was a pretty gutsy statement. 2017, take it to the bank. Because back in 2008, a lot of people were going, that's ah, 2012, it's 2012, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. I didn't see Planet X in 2012. I didn't see any linkage to it. But he knew it was 17. Now, December 21, 2012, we were told is an embarrassing non-event, you know, and folks that were really worried about it, you know, had all their friends and family going, there you go again. It's all nonsense. I don't want to hear about it. Nothing's going to happen. Well, you know, you should go and look at the signs articles we have on our site. And what we show is right after December 21, 2012, we're tracking two data sets, earthquakes of all magnitudes and fireballs. And both of them are just shooting skyward. I mean, the increase is breathtaking. And it's not slowing down. 
um, I just released uh, this year, just released another science video update, and it's continuing to track. So uh, it's only a matter of time before the fireballs are going to be attended by larger rocks because this system's coming in and it's pushing a lot of junk in front of it. It's dislodging a lot of things that are in benign orbits and throwing them to earth crossing orbits. And then when it goes by us, it's going to, it's dragging a lot more junk behind it, which we're going to slam right through. And uh, that'll be another part of it. But uh, overall, I see this year, um, if we are in fact looking at an object that's reaching perihelion by this summer, then things are going to start getting real exciting. We're going to start seeing, we have a dramatic uptick in videos, re observation videos on YouTube right now. I mean, this is going to seem like a trickle compared to what's going to happen. It'll be a flood. Everybody's going to be talking about it. They're going to be yammering about it. So it makes sense that the government is, you know, talking about Planet Nine and this and that. And they're starting to throw out all these theories. And we know it's out there. We haven't found it yet. It's elusive. It's elusive. You know, and then they'll go, whoa, who'd have thunk it? It snuck up on, it snuck up on us from behind the sun, you know. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's probably their strategy and how they're going to deal with it. But again, it comes down to each of us as individuals. How many are going to buy that nonsense and how many are going to say, well, need to do something? But let me ask you then, because it seems like so many people do have that cognitive dissonance. When you attempt over and over to help people just kind of realize that this bubble that they're in, there's a lot more out there, you know, to kind of maybe look outside of the bubble. Do you think maybe sometimes it's just maybe people aren't meant to be out of the bubble. You know, I mean, maybe just their mindset and where they are karmically and everything else. Maybe some people just need to stay in that bubble until, you know, things happen and whatever. Well, that could be it. But I see a lot of manipulation going on. I see a lot of suppression. People are not able to get a good beat on things. And they do that. But, you know, think back to the story of Noah and the flood. I mean... Poor Noah, you know, how many times did somebody walk up to his wife and say, yo, lady, I think your husband's one short of a six pack. Um, his elevator's not going to the top. He's not the brightest bulb on the tree and so forth. And then what happened to them? You know, they're they're left knocking on the hole of the ark and drowning like rats. And I think, you know, why did Noah not open the door? Well, you know, the Bible said God told Noah. Don't open the door. That's all. When this ship has sailed, it has sailed. <laughs> but I think Noah wouldn't have been sitting in the ark listening to all those people pounding on the hull and thinking, nah, 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 you were stupid. You called me names. Now you, you know, now you get to drown like rats. Now, nah, you know, I think he was sitting in there and he was weeping. And he was feeling, you know, the heavy humanity of it. And no doubt wanted to open the ark and to give refuge to all of these people, even though they had mocked and humiliated him so viciously over the years. And he didn't do it because you know, my version on it goes a little bit beyond, you know, God just said, keep the door closed. Well, got to have a have reason for that. You know, what is that reason? Well, imagine, you know, Noah had opened the ark of the to all these folks and let them clambered in, okay? Well, the first day, everybody would have been going, hail Noah, Noah the wonderful, Noah's a fabulous guy. We're so sorry, we were so stupid, blah, 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 blah. You were right, we were wrong. Day two, they get together, form an ad hoc committee, and the ad hoc committee elects a new captain for the Ark. Day three, the new captain of the Ark holds a trial, convicts the Noah and his family of sedition and treason, and they are forthwith thrown off the ark and they drown. Day four, the ark catches fire, burns, and sinks. Well, what was the purpose of the ark? The ark was a, a vessel constructed to facilitate the restoration of terrestrial life to the planet following a major cataclysm. That was the purpose of Noah, was the master, commander, and architect of, architect of this ark. 
Well, if he had let those people in, they wouldn't have been prepared for the mission. They wouldn't have been, all they would be doing is acting stupid and crazy what people do. You know, they um, you know, they just throw common sense to the wind when they get like that. And so if he let them in, sure enough, like I said, within four days, you know, everybody's dead. The ark is burned and sunk under the waves. The mission fails. Terrestrial life is not restored. So when we're looking at all of these people who are, you know, mocking and, and denial and, you know, Particularly what's really sad is the way that they're vicious with people who are in awareness and are looking at it. And it's terrible because the people who are in awareness want to share their awareness. They want to help people. And they're not using information as power. They really are trying to do a kind and loving thing. And the thanks they get for it is to be mocked and ridiculed, isolated. You know, they'll have spouses that say if you don't stop doing this. I'm going to divorce you. And uh, next thing they know, their marriage is, you know, it's like sitting on a big red launch button, destroy, destroy, destroy. That's an awful thing. And it's just human behavior. But on the other hand, there are going to be those who survive. You know, the Georgia Guidestones tell us, keep humanity under half a billion. Doesn't tell us how we get there. Okay. So you're roughly looking at one in 10 of us survive. And what is the reason why 90% die? And what is the reason why 10% live? And it's excellence. I mean, you know, ask, it, there's an interesting statement in uh, sales and marketing courses. And they go, 10% of the salespeople make 90% of the money. Because they're the ones that really get out there and make it happen. And everybody else just talks the talk. And uh, that's what you have with all of this denial and everything going on is you know, a lot of people talk the talk. It's kind of sad I, when I talk with people who are in awareness and I say, you know, do you get the feeling sometime you're the only one-eyed person in a land of the blind? And all the blind people are doing are saying, hey, stupid, get a sharp stick and poke out your one good eye so you can be clever like us. <laughs> You know, but that's the truth of it. That's the way it is. Um, I'm really just trying to be in service to the people who are in awareness and most particularly for the ones who are frustrated because they're going, well, what's the point of being in awareness? I can't afford bullets, beans and bunkers. And it's sad because they're measuring themselves with purely consumer metrics. And that has nothing to do with it. They're uh, the fact that they are in awareness gives them a huge huge advantage a huge edge because when things really do start to get bad all right you're going to have people racing around like idiots saying all kinds of things you know wild eyes eyes flashing you know they're hysterical save my babies save my life But somebody who's been in awareness is going to be like the calm eye in the center of a hurricane. And they're going to be centered, I'm not going to be celebrating or happy, yippee, you know, this is what I've been talking about for years and thinking about for years. They're not going to do that. But on the other hand, they're going to be centered, calm. And what will happen is leaders will see that. And then they'll talk to them. And this is the whole strategy. I mean, on my book, Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, I put the entire strategy on the back cover of the book, which is just, it's just three paragraphs, if I can read it, because this is for those in awareness. And what I say is you are in awareness because God intends for you to be a part of the solution. Read and study this book thoroughly to prepare yourself for your true mission and calling. Then when a spiritual leader you admire and respect is saying, seeing the same clear and present danger that you are, your path is simple. Hand that leader this book as you say, you need a plan, and this is the plan that will work for what is coming. Please read it, and if you have any questions, I'm always at your service. Say so the point of the book is it's written for faith-based leaders, because these are the ones that are going to organize during this last window of opportunity. When everybody's looking up at the sky, you know, 
They go, Ooh, what's that? You know, and then they go to CNN and they get the big lie. All right. There's going to be the ones that are going to say, hey, I'm going to believe my lying eye. We've got a clear and present danger. And if they're the leaders of a church, they're going to know it's time to get their flocks to safety. And that's what they're going to be looking for. So that's the strategy. Is, that's what I'm saying is you need to find these church leaders, these spiritual leaders who are going to have enough common sense to know that they need to lead their flocks to safety. And so for those who are going, well, gee, I don't have my, you know, my, I, I don't have bullets, beans, and bunkers. All right. Well, I address that in the second paragraph. And I say, are you worried for yourself and your loved ones because you cannot afford a mountain of beans? Then prove that you are worth your weight in beans by using this book as a bridging tool. It will help you to establish your value as a teacher, mentor, and comforter to those whom you are in service to. By reading and studying this book, you'll experience firsthand the true power of the mentoring process. Then when the time comes, be yourself as you mentor and comfort tribulation leaders through the difficulties of awareness compression. In this way, you will gain their confidence, both through your centeredness and through your devotion to serving others. That's it. That's the strategy. If you're in awareness, here's a strategy to survive. And if you don't have that, then do you have a million dollars to go build a bunker and stockpile it? And if you don't have a million dollars to build a, you know, a bunker to stockpile it, and you don't want to use this as your way to go out and be in service to others and survive so that you and your family can survive, well, then what have you got? What do you got? Frustration? Denial? Procrastination? Tribulation toking? All kinds of meaningless gestures to do something frivolous that you think is substantial and is just a wisp of smoke in the wind? What have you got? So that's what I'm doing, and that's also the reason why I started my church, Knowledge Mountain Church of Perpetual, Menace, Perpetual Genesis, and uh, which is at knowledgemountain.org. And I'm really just trying to focus on and help people who are in awareness and help them to do this role, to survive by being in service to others. And, uh, you know, we call it purposeful survival for an enlightened future. And there are things that conventional preppers just seem to miss. I mean, the model that I see them doing, I have been doing for a long time, is really based on Cold War shelter strategies. And, you know nuclear, biological, and radiological, and NBR. Well, what they did was in the 21st century, you know, like laundry soap, new and improved, it's NBR plus E, earthquakes. So if you prepare for those four things, you're going to cover anything you need to cover. And then after that, well, you're clever. Just work it out as you go along. And that's pretty short-sighted, considering we're looking at a tribulation that's probably going to last a decade. And... You know, at some point, I don't care how much you have of anything, you're going to lay your head down at night and you're just going to say, God, I'm just really sick of this existence. I'm tired of this life. I'm tired of living in fear. I'm tired of living in misery. Please, God, take me in my sleep. You know, if you've led a good life, maybe God will answer your prayer. If not, you're going to wake up and it's just going to be another bad day. And if you don't have something to give you hope for the future, it's really going to be just another bad day. And then how many of those bad days do you have to have before you finally stick a pistol in your mouth and eat a bullet? So I want people to have a sense of a noble sense of purpose. Okay. And that, you know, where are we going with this thing? What's the backside going to look like? The backside is when we have blue skies, taste sweet waters once again. And uh, for preppers, you know, their light at the end of the tunnel, they have no idea what it is because their strategy is, you know, figured out as you go along after the major event. And it's going to, even after their strategy, you're going to have to wait a while to find that light at the end of the tunnel, which could be an oncoming train. But with our strategy, you know, we make folks that join the church create what we call a mission victory plan. We say, What's it going to look like on the backside? Give us, paint a picture for us. Now, and it's interesting. People talk about communities working together, growing food, happy, celebrating, children playing in beautiful blue ponds. They have these 
beautiful mental visions, pictures in their minds of what it's going to look like. And then part of that mission victory plan is, okay, now you know what victory looks like. You don't start something unless you know what victory is going to look like. For God's sakes, Vietnam taught us that. And the fact is, you've got to, if you're going to have a purposeful existence, you've got to ask yourself, what am I going to do to make that vision come about? If I see happily, happy families celebrating together, enjoying life together, if that's the vision of success I see, what am I going to do getting there? Because during the tribulation, it's the skies aren't going to be blue. They're going to be yellow, red, black, green gritty, miserable, they're going to stink, uh, waters are going to be polluted by iron dust, so you're going to need to have good wells or springs that you can access, water's going to become a premium thing, you know, living in that kind of world where, you know, it's no longer turn a tap or flip a switch easy, but it's brutal hard life every day. For those of us in the industrialized world, it's going to be a horrible difference of kind. The folks that live in the third world, where they already spend a good part of their day finding f firewood and water that they can drink and, uh, you know, basically subsistence and getting by, Planet X Tribulation is just going to be another version of bad day. And they'll deal with it like they deal with the current bad days. They'll pull together as villages, communities, and clans. And they'll help each other and they'll struggle through and they'll do real well with it. But it's those of us that are going to be in the industrialized world that are going to be essential to that Star Trek future. That's what, you know, in my mind, when I think about what does victory look like, I see a Star Trek future. I see us going to the stars and being embraced by other races as friends, not as stormtroopers for the Anunnaki going out there to pillage, rape, and steal. And um, yeah, we're not going to have that Star Trek future if we wind up, you know, regressing back to, you know, hey, does anybody know how to build a sundial? If we're back to sundials, it's, you know, we lose all that. I think that we need to come out of it with knowledge intact. It's why I say that surviving the tribulation is less about the having of things and more about the knowing of things. That's really going to be important. You know, you can go out and get a bunch of old ham radio parts, CBs, car batteries, whatever, and you just have bins of this stuff and you set it on the floor and, you know, people look at it and they say, well, we need to make radios to talk to other people. And they're looking at all this stuff that's been gathered and nobody can make sense of out of it. Nobody knows what to do. But then you got some guy who's 70 years old and been a ham buff since he was, you know, in high school and he looks at it and he goes, yippee, <laughs> you know, I'm in Disneyland, baby, watch me go. And he starts building radios out of stuff that other people wouldn't you know, know the first thing to do with. So the having of things is not as important as the knowing of things. And that is what we in the first world, that's our responsibility. We have the knowing of things. We need to make sure that we carry that forward so that at the backside, when we're seeing blue skies and we're tasting sweet waters again, that there's a technological renaissance and one where we use technology again, but we don't use it for exploitation and you know, with total disregard for the planet. We use it judiciously. We use it wisely and uh, to enhance life and to get off planet and do things. And that will be a technological renaissance. In other words, we're very good at inventing things. You know, what we need for a real technological renaissance is that we need to have technology moving at the pace of morality and ethics. And if we have a true evolutionary event through this and i believe that this will be an evolutionary event for humanity yes we're going to be knocked down in numbers really really heavy but those who do survive uh, are going to be stout-hearted and they're going to be good people they're going to pull through and you know this will be living living you know a, a lasting impression upon them and going forward and that new beginning and starting over so you know the opposing idea is that we wind up in some sort of Mad Max world. And I don't see that happening because I don't think that, frankly, uh, the Mad Max types are going to survive long enough to make it through a decade-long tribulation 
because the good people, the stout-hearted people, those that walk humbly with their God and believe in noble virtues, uh, they're just not going to lay down and let the lions eat them, okay? Uh, they're going to be pretty tough. And they're going to go out and hunt down these monsters and eradicate them. And they're not going to wait for the monsters to come find them in their communities. You'll have former military, you'll have police, you'll have guys that, you know, they have the know-how to reach out and touch somebody from a mile away, how to stalk them, how to hunt them. And they'll go out and they'll do that. And they'll do it for the communities that they're a part of. And they'll be loved in the communities for doing what they're doing because they will be noble guardian warriors. And that is going to be an important role. So all of this you know, dark nonsense that Hollywood is pumping at us, no, it's going to be good God-fearing people that are going to have the guts to stick it out. The ones that are busy uh, just doing, you know, when things are at their worst, they're at their worst. They'll have their day, but then they'll fade because the bottom line is the creation of life, the making of good things takes good people. Bad people can only take. They don't create anything useful. And when there's enough good people to band together to take out the bad ones, they will. They will. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things I grew up in Arizona. And uh, what we see of the West is uh, from Hollywood is not like, you know, the old folks that I knew briefly growing up who had lived in the 1800s. And, and they remembered what it was like in those days. And they said, yeah, you had some of that nonsense going on. But it was always, you know, in one part of town, it was tightly controlled. Uh, but for the rest of the town, people just made life. And they made life uh, with a high degree of uh, ethics and morality. And so I see a return to this, that pioneer type environment. That's the reason why I think preppers have this strategy of me and I. And they go, you know, it's just I'm going to build something for, you know, 10 people or less. And we're going to. We're going to survive because we believe that strength and technology equals strength in numbers. Nope, doesn't. They believe that they're going to be able to stay off the radar and not be detected by anybody. Nope. Somebody wants to find you, they're going to find you. And they're going to think that, well, we're clever people. You know, we'll just cross our bridges when we come to them. Well, when a bridge burns, you're on one side of it alive or on the other other side of it dead that's the truth of it uh so if you're earnest you're using your smarts you're working with others you're going to do much better in the long run those are the ones that will come out of the tribulation and uh, they're going to come out of the tribulation profoundly changed people are you know it's it's an interesting thing how environment affects us when i lived in california in the bay area you know you have a lot of density packing. People are packed in on each other. And, you know, try and start a conversation in a grocery store or something like that. And people just be polite. And they just kind of smile gratuitously and, and then move around. It's like, ooh, ooh, he's one of those, one of those, one of those. You know, and you're in my space. You're in my space. See, I have a little bubble here. You have are impinging in my bubble. And so you had all this bubble impingement. And even when I lived in a smaller area, Santa Cruz, you know, bubble impingement, that's the way it was. But, you know, here I am in Reno, and it's what a joy to be here. It reminds me of Phoenix, Arizona when I was a kid growing up. It's about the same population. And I enjoy You go to the store, and people start conversations with you. You start conversations with them. It's got that nice small town feel. And it's really, really great. Now, when you think about it, the... Uh, the majority of people are going to survive the tribulation. They're not going to be from the coastlines. Those are all going to be inundated. Uh, it's going to be the people in the flyover states where you can walk into a store and get into a fun conversation with anybody at a moment's notice. And people are polite. They open the door. They say nice things to each other. You know, it's, uh, it, it's a complete difference. And so you know, living in an area where you got that small town feel, really did give me a refreshed sense of hope for the future because these are the very kinds of areas that are going to survive the coming tribulation. Not the big cities on the coast where, you know, 
you're impinging on my bubble. <laughs> that kind of nonsense. So for those that are in awareness, you know, it's folks, it's really not about bullets, mains, and bunkers. Because when the time comes, there's going to be about 10%, maybe 20% tops of the population that's going to go, excuse me, but I'm going to believe my lying eyes. This is a clear and present danger. You need to do something. And the rest of them are going to be going, just like Y2K. It's just like Y2K. All nonsense. I'm not going to buy into it. They tell me it's an interesting light show. I believe them. They don't have any reason to lie to me. Yeah, they're going to do that. So the smart thing is you start making yourself worth your weight in beans if you can't afford a hill of beans, as I say. And uh, then you start looking around for faith-based communities. And typically there'll be smaller independent churches where the leadership has a much closer hand on things. And then you get to know them. They're these people you would want to survive with. And then you take a look at the leadership and you determine if they're the kind of people that they'll be that one in 10 that'll say, I believe in my lion eyes. And uh, they're going to go it their way. And if they do, then you want to affiliate with those faith-based organizations. And you want to be able to come in with your knowledge and understanding of what's coming because they're going to need this. Because they're going to be asking questions. Why are we dying? Why is this happening to us? Why were we lied to? Why this? Why that? Why the other thing? Yeah, you know, you're going to, excuse me, a lot of folks doing grapevine rumors, talking about all kinds of stuff because they don't know. And they're just going to, excuse me, just be cooking it up as they go along. But there you are. You've been studying this. You understand it. You know what's going on. You're centered. You're quiet. They can see that composure. And then when you speak, you just say enough to answer a question. You know, don't go, you know, don't go on like, you know, <laughs> a cheap tent flap in the wind. Uh, you know, you just answer like a wise person does. You sit, you listen to everything they say, think about it, and then you answer with as few words as possible. And then they're going to go, wow. You know what you're talking about. You're bringing in a sense of understanding to us about what's going to happen, and we need this. Why don't you join us? And that's when you say, great, would like to. By the way, I have my family. Can they come with me? You know, at that point, what's this, uh, what's this community going to say? You know, no, we want you, but not your family. <laughs> you know, that's what they say. You just, you pick the wrong ones to saddle up with. Uh, but... Now, the bottom line is it's not communities of 10 or less, these little survival bunker strategies. It'll be communities of 100 or more, strength in numbers. This goes back to pioneer lore. You see, that there's nothing that proves that surviving in groups of 10 or less in something like this, unless you're stranded on a desert island when your airplane crashes, and that's it. You're the only 10 bodies on the planet, on, on the island. But, you know, if you're in a tribulation survival situation and there's 10 of you, well, you know, what happens when one or two get sick, then another one or two are going to have to take care of them. And then what happens when your 10-year-old sitting there with the $3,000 customized AR-15 with the red dot scope and the custom barrel and all of that other stuff, and he's sitting there with this wonderful rifle and he falls asleep on guard duty, you know? What's that going to do for you? On the other hand, you got a community of 100 people or more. So is there anything that proves that work? Well, you know, how about the entire, how about the United States west of the, the Mississippi River kind of proves it? Because what did you have? You had pioneering families. They'd sell what they had. They'd relocate for better opportunities. They'd buy Conestoga wagons and oxen. And then they'd form wagon trains. And they would go in vast numbers, and we're talking low technology, low technology, but smart technology. You choose your weapons well. You choose your technology well. And when these groups, these large parties would encounter danger, what do you do? Circle the wagons, and everybody covers everybody else's back. And that's worked because 
everything west of the Mississippi proves it worked. Okay, so if it worked then, why won't it work during the tribulation? Who's to say it wouldn't? Who's to say that something that was only an idea for survival that was dreamed up during the Cold War, which was never tested, is the smarter thing to do because it's newer. Newer doesn't mean anything. What you want is whatever you look for solutions, you're always looking to the past for things that survived because if it worked, that's the reason why we know about it. There's a lot of things that were tried, didn't work. We don't know about them today. Things that worked, we know about them today. And so that's the basic logic of it. And, you know, for your listeners out there, again, the three major causes of death, denial, procrastination, and location. When it comes to denial and procrastination, you know, you want to drink the Kool-Aid, well, that's your right. Do it. On, you know, when it comes to relocation, you know, you need to get to some place that's more survivable. Once you get there, then you can get situated. And that's another thing. You know, everybody, when they approach survival planning and preparation, they want to have the master plan in place. And they want to have all of the gizmos and gadgets in place. You know, first thing they do, create a stockpile. No. The first thing you do is you start solving problems. You start solving the most immediate problem. When you solve that, that you go to the next one, you solve it, and you it's a continual problem-solving situation. So if you're going to relocate for your folks that are listening and they're out on the coastlines, I do reconnaissance to different areas of the country, and it's absolutely imperative that you do a recon. There's an awful lot you can learn about a region just by driving through it. Stopping off, having a cup of coffee at a local cafe, meeting people in a local park, you know, do the visitor center. And certainly, you know, when you go to the grocery store, look for all the local newspapers, magazines, and snap all those up, get all that local flavor. You can learn an awful lot. And that's important. Um, but you're, you know, in general, what I tell people is you want to be 150 miles away from any major body of water, like an inland sea, like a Great Lake, which is essentially an inland freshwater sea, and your, you know, your oceans and Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of Alaska, so forth. Uh, you're 150 miles inland. That's good. It can. That's a general rule of thumb. Elevation is important. Uh, in terms of general elevation areas that are, I like around uh, 2,500 to 3,500 feet above sea level. You get above 5,000 feet, farming's going to get hard, and uh, you're going to have to do. Uh, you're going to have to be able to do a lot of farming to survive afterwards, and so you want to be at a good altitude for that. You're looking for areas where you have soft soil, rolling hills. And lots of fresh, good water, sweet water, you know, springs. Uh, you know, you want to be able to drill wells. You know, back east, I remember in Ohio, you know, family had a, they had a house and it was just, the well was sat right, the aquifer was polluted with iron. It was just terrible. You know, you see those. So you go into those areas, you know, they're going to be on well water. And you, hey, you know, even if you don't have to use the bathroom, go use the bathroom. Look to see if you got iron rings in the commode. All right. It's that kind of smart stuff. Um, look at it to see what the proximity is to nuclear power plants and uh, nuclear facilities, because a lot of these are going to go Fukushima on us once things happen. People think, well, don't worry. You know, it's a disaster. They scram the reactor. Well, that's what they do. But you got to keep the reactor cool for a couple of years while that fuel is cooling down. And that means you have to have power, you have to have pumps running, and you have to have water. And if you don't have those, what do you have? You have a Fukushima, which is you got three cores that melted through. The corium are in the ground. And Fukushima is a nuclear volcano, and they can't do anything about it. They literally cannot do it. There's no way to stop this hell on Earth that they have created. And worse yet, 
there is an underground river runs directly under the plant. I mean, it's like, it's like, oh my God, they just must have been, here's your bottle of stupid pills. Just, you need more? Let us know. We got all the stupid pills you need because we're just in it to make a return on investment. You know, and that's how they designed that plant. And well, it's pumping radiation directly into the Pacific every day and will for a long time. And it will kill the Pacific and probably uh, do a heck of a lot of damage to the other world, you know, the other oceans as well. So we're going to have Fukushima's. We're going to have these China syndrome things that are going on. And it's going to be really bad. And so what I tell folks is uh, at a bare minimum, you want to be upwind 50 miles away from the plant downwind 100 miles away uh, the other thing you want to be careful of is fracking and fracking is uh, these well casings uh, are they're designed to last 30 years uh, some a small percentage fail on day one but 30 years under normal operating conditions well you're not going to have normal operating conditions when you have major fault lines like the new madrid and the San Andrea and the Cascadia, and these things are popping off because when these major fault lines go with these magnitude 9, 10, whatever quakes are going to generate, we're going to feel it all across the country. Last time New Madrid popped, church bells in Philadelphia were ringing. Okay. Well, if you can ring church bells in Philadelphia, what about all the fracking wells in Pennsylvania? Yeah. What's, it's going to ring those wells as well. And then when they fail, then that toxic witch's brew that they use for fracking is going to seep up into the aquifers and you're going to have poisoned water and, and dead land. And so it's really sad because there, for this particularly people living on the eastern coast, there was a whole number of areas in Pennsylvania that were really phenomenal. Western New York, you know, real super survivable areas. And uh, a, a lot of those are gone. So, you know, in general, you got to check and see what the water tables are. And, you know, if it's something where they have drilled through a major aquifer, God forbid, uh, that's a problem. But I would say anywhere from 15 to 25 miles distant from any fracking field. And that's a rule of thumb. So you have that. You know, it's important that you want to have rolling hills. Um, there are a lot of folks that want to move out to the plain states and, you know, you go back to pioneering lore. I mean, they would get these prairie, prairie grass fires. My God, they were awful. Like, a lot of people died, terrible deaths as a result of that. And so we're going to have these big prairie grass fires. They're going to happen. So you want to, you don't want to be out there on the prairies. You want to be out there where there's nice rolling hills and uh, soft earth, it's real important, particularly with the rolling hills and the soft earth, because you want to be able to dig into the side of a hill so you can create radiation. And uh, one of the things I point out in my book, Surviving the Planet X Tribulation, is the various densities of things that are going to be readily accessible, sand, wood, you know, uh, earth, and so forth. Because you have to have radiation shielding. When we have these solar storms, and we're going to have awful solar storms, the radiation just comes straight down. It, you know, sometimes rain comes in sideways, uh, but not with this. The radiation is just going to come straight down right through the top of your head. And so you're going to need to have radiation shelters uh, during times when there's a lot of solar activities. And there's interesting, there's little things you can do, you know, those little uh, radios, wristband radios, things like that, you know, useful, uh, particularly the FM radios. And you just have them on, let them play static. And then when you hear that static kick out like that, then that little digital radio and that watch has fried. At that point, you know, you're in the middle of a solar flare and uh, that's going to, you're going to have a lot of radiation coming down for about 30 minutes. And if you can get it, you know, to safety real quick, within a few minutes after that, you're going to do fairly well. On the other hand, if you're caught out in the open, uh, you know, keep in mind our magnetosphere is weakening. So we're not going to have the shelter from this solar radiation, the solar wind uh, that we have now. So these are the kind of things people need to think about.
need to be aware of. Um, and if you're in awareness, you're going to know all this stuff. You're going to know that after the pole shift, the last major event is going to be flying through the tail of the Planet X system. And that's something that's going to catch people unawares. Now, the interesting thing is uh, Mother Shipton has a very specific prophecy about that. And she says, you know, it's going to come through and uh, then it's going to pass and everybody's going to go, ha ha, we survived, we're clever, we're going to feel pretty cocky and arrogant. And people are not going to know that we're going to swing around once again and fly through the tail of the system. And as she says it, you know, cracks its tail on the earth and it causes yet another hardship. And that will happen. So a lot of people who survived the pole shift are going to die because they don't know that's coming. But if you're somebody in awareness and you've been studying and thinking about this, you're going to know. And if you're a part of a community, you're going to be able to explain it to the people in the community. And they're going to believe you because you have understood the whole process from soup to nuts, every stage of it, what to expect, how to handle things, what to do about things. And you've had good, sober, sound advice, and it has served the community well. And so they will respect you. You know, it'll be, think of like Native American culture, where they have medicine men and medicine women and People in the tribe would look up to them for wise advice, all right, and insights. Same thing. So this is why your awareness is something. It's a God-given gift. You know, God didn't give it to you, so you'd be a frustrated consumer with, you know, a <laughs> very limited MasterCard available credit. Um, God didn't give it to you that. It has nothing to do with money. There'll be people who buy bullets, beans, and bunkers. They'll buy all of it. What they don't have is peace of mind. They don't have, they don't know what the process is. They don't know what's really coming. They don't have the answers to the why questions that are going to keep them up all night. You're going to be able to help them with that. Why? Because your role is to be a teacher, a mentor, and a comforter. That's why you're in awareness. You're not a leader. The leaders, they will appear. Your role is something that is, you are in service to leadership. You are in service to the community. And... People who are in awareness, um, the vast majority of them, without, with rare exception, are uh, gentle, kind-hearted people, and they're sensitives, they're intelligent, they can see people holistically, and that's important. That'll be an important thing during survival, is to be able to see people holistically, mind, body, and soul, how everything's connected. Uh, today, we don't see people holistically, we see behaviors. And so we respond to behaviors. That's the reason why we have prisons. We're controlling behaviors. We're not looking holistically at the environment or the people, what they're dealing with and what puts them into their prisons as much. And so we, during the tribulation, that's going to be important, that ability to do that. And there are some folks that will debate, well, if I'm going to go through the tribulation, do I have 9 millimeter pistols or 45 caliber pistols? Do I have this? Do I have that? If you're someone in awareness, the ability to sit down and drink a cup of tea with somebody and have a heart-to-heart -heart chat that helps them settle down and feel some hope for the future and a reason to go back to the business of survival, what you've got to offer is worth a lot more than all the pistols you could put in the armory. Not that they're not important. They are. A lot of things are going to be important during the tribulation that we don't think are important now. But it's being in service to others. And that's what I'm advocating. That's what I'm teaching. And I know I'm only reaching a, a fraction of 1%, maybe a fraction of a fraction of 1%. But it's what I do, Rex. Well, you do a really good job of it, too. And I got to tell you, you've been doing this for over 10 years, and you've built a strong reputation. And one of the things that I appreciate is also you offer different mindsets than a lot of people that, like you said, okay, well, you've got to have a half million bucks if you want to get into this really nice resort that's underground. Now, at the same time, I appreciate people that have the money and can get prepared too, because there are those people out there that do have the money and they do have the mindset of wanting to prepare a better life for the future. So the majority of people though, like you said, maybe are a little bit more lopsided on particular things and maybe they could kind of 
balance it out a little bit. You know, that's one of the cool things about a faith-based community, even if people don't have the same specific, you know, if they don't believe, you know, okay, well, your God's better than my God or whatever. You know, I mean, that's the kind of thing where people most of the time kind of realize that there is a higher power. Most people feel that way. And as long as they don't get into the, the, the nitty-picky, you know, oh, well, th- he has blonde hair. No, he has red hair. No, it's not a he, it's a she. No, it's not a he or a she, it's an it. Or it's, you know, just like, okay, well, you know, so, and, and I appreciate that. And, and with that said, I would strongly recommend our audience go to YOWUSA.com. Um, you've got the Colburn Bible. You've got several other books that are really good. You come up with articles uh, almost daily. And it's funny because I want to show your website before we close out, but I can't because I'm getting disconnected from the internet. And I've noticed that about at least half of this conversation, I've been disconnected from the internet, which is really strange because we still have this Skype conversation. So it must be meant to be. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Be the change you want to see, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Leak Project. I am your host, Rex Bear, and we have Marshall Masters with us from YOWUSA.com. Is Planet X nearing Perhelion? Now, I might have said that name a little bit off, but Marshall will correct me. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight here at The Leak Project. Marshall, how the heck are you? All right. Oh, it's great to be back, Rex. Right on. I appreciate you reaching out to me. And also, I've been looking through this article, and you've done it quite well. I mean, there's a lot of information on here, and I was hoping we could just jump right in. You see some possible dire straits type events happening here pretty soon. Well, you know... This is something where we've been wondering when will Planet X or the Planet X system reach perihelion? Specifically, when will the sun's smaller twin, Nemesis, a brown dwarf star, when will it reach its point of perihelion in its 3,600-year orbit, which is that point closest to the sun? And here is something that comes with blue Kachina, red Kachina prophecy, because I, this really began with the most bizarre things. Uh, somebody asked me to listen to uh, a YouTube video by Archangel Michael. And as a rule, I just tend to sidestep machine language videos. You know, the ones that you can always tell it's a machine. <laughs> and right. it just has that consistent, you know, um, that elevator quality to it. And there was something in there that caught her attention. And then she said, well, is the pole shift going to happen on March 20th of this year is what this guy's saying. Well, it's March 21st. So that obviously was an error. Uh, But what was interesting was that I listened to it and they were talking about March 20th being perihelion then they said march 20th was the equinox well it's the equinox not the perihelion that is for our planet however they did bring a question in my mind well what about perihelion for planet x and i was thinking about that and then there was a video that showed up and you know i have several folks that send me links to all the newest stuff and one of the things we've begun seeing is uh, a blue halo, a larger object that is to the three o'clock of the sun relative to the horizon, which is not actually where it is in space. If you were to you know, be off Earth and you were looking at the sun uh, relative to the sun's equator, which, you know, if you just expand that out to the 12 signs of the zodiac, that's the galactic, that's the uh, ecliptic, the plane of our system. And when you do that, then this object is actually about the 130 position. But we have been tracking this extensively. I have reported it in my video, Planet X Update number four, the second of that three-part series, which was Reliable Observations, where we had the same object appearing in Brazil, Spain, and elsewhere around the world. And so it was pretty consistent. We were getting good images on it. And they were holding up to gamma analysis. And gamma analysis that I do is think of your home stereo system 
and you have all the different controls. You can have an equalizer for setting, you know, low bands, high bands, mid bands. You can set treble. You can set bass. You can boost. You can do all this stuff. But then you got that big volume knob. And when you crank that down, what you notice is you crank it down as, you know, different parts of the music start to go away. And what's left at the end is going to be, you know, like a bass drum, bass guitar, thump, thump, thump. Boom, 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 that kind of stuff. That's what's left. Well, when you're looking at digital image mine, this is only something that could be done with digital cameras, not with film cameras. But gamma is like that big volume knob. It turns everything up or it turns everything down. However, when you turn it down, there are a lot of things going to go away, but then there's things that are going to, you know, thump, the thump, the thump, they're going to stay. So I divide these into two classes, cold objects and hot objects. Now, a hot object is something that is generating light toward the camera, or it could be something that has a very strong reflection of light towards the camera. But there is a strong source of light coming from that object, and this is common to natural objects. Now, you have cold objects, for example, uh, clouds are kind of lukewarm, coldish. So they'll disappear, but they can hang in there for a little bit on gamma analysis until you really crank it down. The one thing that's going to disappear very quickly in gamma are going to be lens flare, flares and aberration. Uh, this is not an absolute. Uh, particularly with smartphones when you're taking digital still images, and they can create false, pro false positives. But it's a very good general rule of thumb. And so when I'm doing smartphone observations, and that's really what you get these days, I'm looking for video. I'm not looking for stills. Stills, I just don't pay a serious attention to that. But if it's a video, then you're able to see if they're, especially if it's handheld, they're moving around, if the object of interest remains fixed and relative to the sun, or if it dances all around like a lens flare. So these are the kind of tests that I do, and there's some others, but these are the principal ones that I do. And then if it stands up to that, the next thing I'll do is pull up Starry Night, or even, you know, you can, for those at, at home, you don't want to get into a sky program, uh, there's solar system scope. You go to their website for free and put in a date and a time, and you can see what the alignment of the planets in our solar system. And with this three o'clock position, given the size, of, and if you look at the top of the article, where it's actually the image is planet X nearing perihelion, this was a screen of the gamma test. And the object of interest is to the right of the sun, again, at the three o'clock relative to the horizon. And what really stood out for me was when I looked at the original imagery, it had a bluish little halo to it, a corona. And that really, during the gamma testing, came out even more intense. And the reason why, Rex, this really got my attention is that it brings us to the Hopi prophecy of, of the blue kachina and red kachina. And for those that may not have heard of that before, there's an ancient Hopi prophecy. It's been written about extensively. And there's two kachinas or stars that are going to be apparent. The first one will be a blue star. And then it is the harbinger of the worst uh, of the two, which is the red star, which will then appear afterwards. Well, most people tend to think of this prophecy as talking about two different stars. And if people do not understand, you know, Doppler waves, then they're not going to understand that you're really talking about the same image. And it's called red Doppler shift and blue Doppler shift. And what it really means is when an object is closing on you in space, the light waves are they're going to be compressed, and so it's going to be bluish. When you're spreading apart, the light waves are going to elongate, and so it looks reddish, hence redshift or blue shift. So what that really means is if it's blue, blue shift, you know that, that you're 
And that is, you know, I've been talking with several of the folks that uh, communicate with me and in these reports where there's this little bit of blue halo. Well, that would tend to indicate that the nemesis star with us and that it could very well be it is in that phase of its orbit and this is all in the article i break it all, all down uh but there's a heading called acceleration at perihelion now rex at this point i, I do want to throw something in because i debunked the debunking strategy of what's called center of mass describing the relationship of nemesis and our sun and in binary star systems you got two stars that are large. One is going to be larger than the other typically, but they're going to find a common center of mass and they're going to orbit around that center of mass. And so when we're talking about planet X or nemesis being in a comet like 3600 year orbit, they go, well, that's because you have two suns and they would have a center of mass. The key word, all right, and what I point out in that this is a small dwarf, and it's uh, it's not even one percent the mass of our sun. Like saying a hummingbird can nudge a water buffalo. All right, um, that's just not going to happen. That's the reason why Nemesis is in a comet-like orbit. All right, and. And it's a specious argument. It really kind of sucks people in because they talk about diameter. They talk about size. The orbital mechanics here, size has nothing to do with it. Mass, that's got everything to do with it. You know, you can hold a dirt clod in one hand and then you can hold a meteorite in the other. And trust me, you can be really straining to hold the meteorite if they're, you know, both of good size. And uh, so now when we're talking about, you know, we have blue shift and red shift. And what's interesting to me is the point of perihelion, because Kepler's second law, this is about the point in time where Nemesis and the planet X system, all the bodies, start an acceleration phase. And in the image I have on the site, you'll see I actually have a little amusement park of the whip, the ride that you have, where you've got these two levels at each end. And the kids sit there and they ride on the long, you know, straight side of this ride, which is tedious. But then you get to the turnbuckle and you whip right around, which is why they call it the whip. Well, what works in an amusement park is exactly the way it works in the orbit of the nemesis brown dwarf around its larger uh, cousin. And so if that's the case, then in it's in this acceleration phase then it's closing with us. And that would explain the blue shift that we're beginning to see in observation reports. And once it reaches the point of perihelion, and the point of perihelion is where it is closest to the orbit of the sun. And one of the things I do show in the uh, illustration is we go around the sun counterclockwise, but this goes in a clockwise orbit. And this has been reported by astronomers. It's also been reported by Zachariah Sitchin decoding the Sumerian texts. And that's uh, these are important things. So this video about Archangel Michael and the Golden Age, uh, this is something where it they made uh, they made an error when they were mixing perihelion equinox. But the interesting thing is, you know, it doesn't matter how big the star bar of soap is, if you flip on it, you fall in the shower. So let's get to the meat of the matter perihelion. What does this mean to everyone on planet Earth? Well, there is an area in the orbit which we call the kill zone for this planet X system. Now, for the better part of its orbit, or most of its orbit, it's in the southern skies and it doesn't present a problem. Even when it 